Dr. Kaser, Dan, welcome to Inside Reproductive Health. Thanks, Griffin. Great to be here with you. Good to have you on. We were saying before we started that it's 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 like we've known each other. This is the first time we've actually spoken face to face, so to speak, via video. And when we were talking, you mentioned something that I thought would be interesting for the intro. One of the reasons why I wanted to have you on was talk to, to talk about serving LGBTQ plus population as a practice area. And it was also, which is what you do now in the Bay Area, but it's also part of the reason why uh, you, you chose either your fellowship program or the first practice you worked with. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, I ultimately went into reproductive medicine and infertility specifically to, to, um, to be able to help my own community in terms of other LGBTQ um, patients. I, I knew at the time that for me to have you know, a family, this was the path that I personally would be taking. And so I became interested in IVF early on in medical school, actually, um, through, you know, introduction to reproductive physiology by some really great professors, and then had done some away rotations, even as a med student uh, on like the infertility unit. So I, I fell in love very early with, with actual, um, the actual profession. But you know, I was commenting that, um, reflecting back that uh, my husband and I got married in 2009 in New Hampshire. Um, we met, my husband Dana is a, a physician as well, and we met in medical school. And at the time in 2009, New Hampshire was actually one of the only states in the country that recognized same-sex marriage. And so what felt to be a very um, new kind of cutting edge thing, um, you know, now, fortunately, it, it almost seems commonplace in, in terms of two men or two women getting married. But, you know, we, we had a church service and had a reception on campus and uh, were surrounded by, you know, dear, dear friends and family members. And this was, you know, six years, I guess, before the Supreme Court ruling um, to legalize gay marriage across the country. And so, you know, in... Um, in choosing, frankly, where I did my like postgraduate uh, residency and fellowship training, we looked to states at the time that allowed gay marriage and recognized our marriage. And we ended up moving to, uh, to Boston, Massachusetts, where I did OBGYN residency and then stayed stayed for, for fellowship training. And then at the end of my fellowship um, in 2016, you know, had, had been looking for my first position out, outside of um, kind of the training um, sphere and um, still was, was looking for, for states that, that uh, were inclusive in terms of marriage law. And so I signed, I, I came to RMA for a number of reasons, but um, in 2004, 14 is when I initially um, signed, signed contracts to, to come on. And at that point, it was still like a year before um, the Supreme Court rule. And so truly, like if you look back at, at the places that I went to medical school, residency, fellowship, even my first job, it's informed by like policy and where, where I could, you know, frankly, have, have rights recognized at the time and um, be, you know, felt welcome and celebrated. So, you know, fortunately here in 2022, it, it feels like a lifetime ago that, um, that, you know, there were places in the U.S. that did not recognize um, a relationship like my, my husband and mine. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing to reflect back, like even in those short, um, 10 to 15 years, how, how far we've come along, frankly. So, so that was part of how you chose the state that you ended up at. Well, one of where you got married in New Hampshire in 2009, but then to, to pr practice in 2014 at, uh, at Army. And sorry, that was, that was your, your fellowship was in, was in Massachusetts. Your fellowship was in Boston and then your, and then, so it was your first job after fellowship was in New Jersey. Brand spanking new, like, infertility fellow just just finished and then um, signed on to join RMA of New Jersey and um, 
yeah, and moved moved to actually Philadelphia um, at the time. And the, the practice that I was helping open up uh, in southern New Jersey for RMA was like just across the Delaware River. So I would commute across across state lines and um, would go to work each day. But I was at at RMA New Jersey for a few years and um, really helped help them develop their their LGBTQ kind of care. Why that they, practice though, Dan? So I'm, I'm following why you ended up in New Jersey. Your interest in REI and particularly this application of REI started pretty early. You said you, you were starting to figure it out in med school that this directly impacts my community, d- directly impacts me. And, uh, and a lot of people don't come to that realization so early, you know, well, at least not, you know, for their subspecialty, often they don't even, you know, come to their specialty in li- uh, until a little bit later. And, and you noticed it pretty early on. So, but what, what about the practice continued to follow that line for you? For me, it, um, you know, a couple opportunities that, at RMA that attracted me there, frankly. Uh, one was to help open a new IVF center for them in, in South Jersey. And so, you know, a dear friend and, and partner, Jason Fernasiak, and I helped uh, establish and open a, a, a new center there for, for RMA to kind of anchor the South, um, which was an amazing opportunity directly out of fellowship to be involved in, you know, everything from architectural plans to kind of operational um, and management of, of um, you know, the, the decisions, large decisions down to the very, you know, tiny finishes and things. So that was, uh, was a compelling reason um, right out of fellowship to come to RMA. And then secondly, I had the opportunity to, based on my interests of, you know, egg donation and surrogacy, to help lead their their third party program, um, and so truly, uh, you know, a year out of fellowship, I had had taken on for for the practice of, of twenty five docs or so, um, the, the the director of the third party role, which is was um, you know feel fortunate of that opportunity, and frankly, had really great mentorship uh, there in New Jersey um, to help help me um, kind of establish myself in, in that as, as not only an interest of mine, but something that, you know, I have expertise in and, and I'm excited to be able to offer um, patients, frankly. So it was the, it was really a great, great opportunity at the right time. What was the, what was it like building out the LGBTQ plus practice area part of the third party program practice area. So you, you, you've got a LGBTQ plus focus as a part of third party. What was involved in building that out? Yeah, it's, you know, in, in looking back, it, it, there is already, you know, a program there. And, and frankly, since the practice had opened in 1999, they've been had open doors and have been inclusive to, to patients of, of any sexual orientation or identity. Um, but I think it was more systematically and kind of comprehensively thinking about this as like a sector of, of care that is growing and that we need to, um, you know, have a more cohesive program. Um, and so, you know, the care is in terms of what actually is being done, egg donation and surrogacy, you know, it's not unique to, to gay men, for example, um, but, you know, some the messaging and and frankly um, some of the like content online and how how you interact with patients and what patients expect it is unique uh, and so you know in working with the the third party team there um, it was it was helping to grow you know a few aspects of of the program specifically like advocacy uh, and online presence. Um, for you know LGBTQ care, um, both you know on websites and social media, and then also frankly getting involved in in research uh, in in um, this area as well. So it I think went from you know offering these services to to try to kind of put together a program, frankly, where um, it is not only taking care of patients but also 
the the broader community. Hey, hey Dan, I'm gonna I'm just gonna have us stop for a second because I can hear the folks in the background. Um, and uh, I don't hear them anymore, so they may have. Yeah. Did you do you want me to? I can say something too. Uh, yeah, just in case. No problem. Yeah, I'll step away for one second. Okay. Sorry. Uh, no, all good. So I will have you pick up from the thought of, of when you were talking about messaging and advocacy. Right. So, you know, at RMA, help, helping to establish really a, a comprehensive program for LGBTQ patients, um, I, um, we, we took efforts to develop the advocacy role, frankly, as, as um, physicians and healthcare professionals, you know, uh, thinking about this community and, and what we could potentially offer. And at the time, you know, surrogacy was illegal in, in New York. And so basically like serve, serve to, to lobby, mostly through like newspaper editorials and writing letters to, to senators and, and, um, and representatives in New York, um, just frankly, how important um, this this type of care is for the community. Um, we also, you know, took on some research um, projects specifically to evaluate, you know, best practices for um, for LGBTQ um, patients. One, you know, we published in in a major journal looking at the role of um, one versus two inseminations for single women and also lesbian couples um, using donor sperm to try to establish whether you know a, a single IUI was was sufficient uh, or if a second IUI you know added benefit and did not in that study did not seem to um, and then we also published the experience that RMA has um, with um, over some 10 to 12 years of um, several hundred men who had gone through the egg donation and surrogacy program to become fathers, um, really just talking about access to care. And um, it, it was a, a, um, a, a web-based survey that we distributed to former patients and current patients who, who were undergoing this treatment to ask them questions in terms of how are they paying for this treatment? Uh, is insurance covering it? Um, are they having to travel from out of state to be able to access this? Um, and similarly published published this, and you know, um, we're surprised to learn, frankly, that you know, something like forty or forty five percent of of men who we were seeing uh, like did didn't have the opportunity to do the type of treatment that that we were offering them within their own state. Some of that reflects just the kind of broad catchment area that a practice like RMA has and that you know, people come from out of, out of town, out of state, but, but not all of it in that you know, some, a good number of programs either don't have, have a lot of experience in, in um, this type of care or choose not to develop it. Um, and we were hoping to, you know, by, thinking about this as a more cohesive program, um, hoping to help establish it as, you know, a destination spot for, for, um, for um, gay men and women, frankly, where they would feel welcome. They would see, you know, team members that, that um, were in the community um, and would, would frankly feel celebrated um, undergoing this type of treatment. I think you know in working in some, I now I'm in practice in in um, in San Francisco still with RMA, um, but in um, in San Francisco I'd say you know it's it's roughly one out of five individuals or couples that I see is is LGBTQ or single, and doing this with donor gametes. Um, so it's definitely I have somewhat of a biased perspective, but it's it's a growing um, part of fertility care. 
And you know, these, these um, patients have choice, frankly, in where they go. And in, in meeting with them, I think what's unique about, about the consult that you do is that, you know, they're not typically haven't struggled with years of, of infertility or miscarriage or pregnancy loss. And so are coming from that very initial consult in a different, um, different spot in their life. And, you know, some of them may never have, have uh, thought that they were going to have kids and the decision to, to like set up that initial appointment um, is a large one in that it's like, they're, they're consciously like for the first time, uh, undergoing the steps that are needed to, to have a child and to start their family. Um, you know, the, the, um, pregnancy rates that we can offer, um, through, through this type of treatment, they're really the, the best that, that you can do in, in fertility in terms of in particular egg donation and surrogacy. So this is, you know, it's never, never a guarantee. It's a never a hundred percent certain, but they're overall very, you know, excellent clinical outcomes. And I think the tone of the consult from day one is, is frankly helping them, um, uh, celebrate that choice that they're, that they're starting their family and helping to reinforce that choice that they're, you know, they're making a, a good decision and, and educate them about, about the process, not only for the fertility treatment, but, um, you know, connecting with other, other couples or, or individuals who have, who've, um, done this and have, um, have, have young families. So I it's suspect really that by doing things. that, that you're validating that they came to the right place too. And you mentioned earlier that, that they have a choice in where they go. And it does seem to, to me that a, uh, you know, a handful of doctors or a handful of practices see far more than, um, you know, just, you know, the, the, the proportional representation of same sex couples and, and many see far fewer, uh, perhaps because many see far fewer. And it reminds me of, of so, someone called me a couple of years ago and they really wanted to target same sex couples and particularly same sex male couples. Mm. And, uh, they were just even before we even got to needs or share. How much will it cost? How much will it cost? And I was like, I don't a lot, a lot, because right. you haven't done anything yet, and all you're doing right now is coming and saying, I just want more of these dollar signs coming into my practice. Meanwhile, there are a num there are some people in the in the country, doctors and practices that have really built practice areas for for that so can you talk about a, a little i mean now that you're in the the bay area i'm i'm guessing maybe a lot of those folks are are local but maybe i'm wrong how far are people traveling for yeah it's an interesting question i would say most are within california um currently and you know particularly in the in the bay area there's a, a large community um and it's becoming more and more common for for men to to have you know not only one kid but come back for you know a second child um i would say right now it's probably 10 percent of the um of the patients that i see like specifically for egg donation and surrogacy are um from outside of the state um but just in the last six to 12 months i think the word is getting out um i start i'm starting to see more and more international couples that um that are are um, looking looking for care as well. So I, I think that's frankly the unique perspective in like being a gay man with a child through egg donation and surrogacy. It's something that I'm passionate about in helping other other um, couples go go through the the process, and I think yeah. offer some additional kind of context to the the decisions that have to be made along the way too. So. You have the rapport, the, the personal rapport, because of your own experience, you have the advocacy that you've been a part of. You talked about the messaging as a part of that, but you alluded to some, some systems at, at one point earlier in the conversation. What were some of the systems that you had to update to, to better serve LGBTQ plus patients? 
Yeah, it, it's so it's really fascinating to like sit and and think about this about like and some of it happened organically and other was was more um, uh, thought out. Um, the you know fertility care, frankly, you know, really grew in the '90s and early 2000s, and a lot of the practices that that formed at that time either weren't offering this treatment or weren't offering this treatment well. And so a lot of the systems were, were built, frankly, you know, around straight couples only and, you know, had some inherent biases kind of baked into them, not intentionally in my opinion, but truly just reflective of the care that the, you know, the, the type of patient that they were caring for and, and what a family looked like in the nineties and even early two thousands. What are some examples? Yeah. You know, um, one is, is, is just representation, frankly, online, um, in terms of the, the content that's on, on websites. Um, there was a survey that was done in, in 2017 that was published in, in fertility and sterility that looked at this and they looked at all start reporting members at the time. And they truly just looked at their websites to determine whether or not they had content for LGBT uh, uh, patients or not. And it was actually just 53% of the time um, that the 300 plus start clinics had had any content whatsoever um, for gay for gay couples. I think if you did that study now, if I had to guess, it'd probably be more like 75 or 80%, uh, but it's definitely still not 100%. So just truly even like having content on your website um, and, and like appropriate uh, information there is, is one example. Another example um, is, you know, intake, frankly, like intake forms um, in, and how patients and their, their partners report their medical history and, and basic things like, you know, sexual orientation and gender identity. A lot of, a lot of practices, um, you know, are still their intake form um, are, are gendered um, and assume that they have, assume you have a partner. And so, you know, one of the structural things that, um, that I helped do kind of early on in, in helping establish this program is just frankly to look with a critical eye at the forms that that patients sign um, and and um, and submit on on establishing like a new patient consult everything from you know the non-discrimination policy making sure that it had you know lgbtq kind of identifiers in there to um frankly, collecting sexual orientation at the initial call um, and, you know, preferred pronouns. Um, and you know, the intake forms that, that we started with were, you know, interestingly, they were kind of custom made for different kind of um, types of treatment. Insofar as like a you know a, a heterosexual couple, there is a separate form for a transgender patient. There is a separate form for a lesbian couple. And we thought at the time it felt like the right thing to do, as you could really tailor the questions that you were asking um, to that particular um, type of patient. Um, and then through frankly patient feedback and also um, just an experience in 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 working with with um, different couples, it actually, and not surprisingly, it, it became clear that like these separate forms don't always capture the broad range of experiences people have and the types of patients and, and frankly ways that, that they can do treatment. Um, so it was hard to kind of put, put people into a box of a form. And so we actually like just generalized one form and went back to one in intake form, uh, but made it very, very inclusive. And so, so that's uh, interesting to me because the nature of sort of everything is to become more fragmented, specific. right? More, yeah. more specific, more specialized. Start with, start with three TV channels. Then we had to with cable exactly. and have a hundred. And then we go to the internet and we have infinite. And so one would have thought, okay, we, we're starting from, you know, we're, we're back at a time where it's just partnered male, female couples. And then, uh, and then we start to serve maybe gay women. Then we start to serve gay men and then 
uh, and, and now transgendered couples and others. And so you would have, I would have made the assumption that you, you further, you, you further segment and, Absolutely. and, and your experience taught you otherwise. Yeah. And that, I mean, that is exactly right. And that, that was our initial um, consideration as well. It just didn't, didn't seem to work as, as well as, as a single form did. And just making sure the language in the form had had space and had range to, you know, to um, cater to the different patients that, that we care for. Um, you know, another example of, of this is in terms of um, like looking at kind of structural things about a program is the medical record uh, and how, you know, these episodes are documented um, by the clinical staff um, and whether or not you can, you know, um, query whether, you know, sec sexual orientation or partner status in the medical record. So you can, you know, do, do research. You can't change anything or can't, you know, um, look at whether a, an effect is, is, uh, or intervention is improving anything if you're not measuring it. So truly the first, like one of the first things was like, we have to collect sexual orientation and, um, for everyone coming through the door. Um, and like you, interestingly, it was like, you know, the first time that this was being counted that, that like gay, gay men and women were being counted in the practice. And it's crazy to think about it, but it, it wasn't until the 2020 census actually in the United States that sexual orientation for the first time was like included in the 2020 census. So like also now being counted in the kind of U.S. census as well, um, and with the hope to like that that can by measuring it you can you know address gaps and you know figure out where resources are needed. You can do research projects. So in any event, the, the medical record just is truly um, being able to to count how many consults you're doing of this type is important, and then also other things. Like, you know, allowing nicknaming to happen where you can assign like a nickname for a patient. That's in particularly important for like our trans community in that a lot of trans men and women don't like identify with their birth name. Um, and they actually refer to it as their dead name, like their, their name assigned at birth. And so they go by like a, a nickname. And so whether or not your EMR can, can capture and can assign like nicknames as the preferred names. Um, we looked at consent forms to make sure that consent forms weren't gendered and assumed, um, uh, you know, a partner status. Um, so, you know, I think it it's um, it's looking looking with a critical eye at at every kind of interaction that a patient and a partner might have, from the initial call to the consult with the physician, day to day interactions with the front desk staff. Um, you know, even working with financial counselors and in, in the, the program and and having, um, you know, options for uh, that are inclusive for um, for financing this, frankly, um, there there are some some kind of outside organizations that allow you to take out quite a, a large sum that that of money that you can um, you know, finance at a low interest rate. So just frankly, like having information available about how to make this a feasible thing um, to, to undertake, I think is important. And, and um, you know, being in network with um, some non-traditional payers is not the right word, but the, the major payers like historically in fertility care, you know, are the major payers outside of, of, of um, fertility as well, you know, the, the blues and Aetna and so on. Um, but, you know, some of these groups, and I have no relationship with any of them, but Progeny and Kara and Maven, some of these payers are, are, are doing, frankly, really revolutionary things for LGBTQ care in that they offer egg donation and surrogacy benefits, but they don't, they're not concerned whatsoever about a patient's sexual orientation. So one of the biggest ironies in my career as like a fertility doctor, start like going to set out to start my family is at the time I was in practice, you know, in New Jersey, a mandated state. 
and truly had really amazing fertility benefits through a major pair that covered everything in, in IVF. It covered you know, egg donation. It even covered like a reimbursement for, for surrogacy. But the irony is that based on, you know, who I was married to, uh, I actually didn't have access to any of those benefits um, in a mandated state as a fertility doctor with really, really comprehensive plan. Um, and, you know, that doesn't sit with you well when, when you experience something like that firsthand. And, um, you know, fortunately, there are other, other ways to make, make that journey feasible. Um, but in looking, in looking back at it, you know, the, there are a lot of, um, a lot of insurance companies, frankly, in, in, in my opinion, are discriminatory um, still against, against our community in, in helping establish you know, families. And, and they, they have a very, you know, I, I think outdated um, definition of infertility and like who, who has access to this type of care in that um, you know, they're defining sexual intercourse between a man and a woman, not leading to conception after six or 12 months. So, you know, for one in 20 individuals in the U.S. now, um, that's not a reality. Um, and so, you know, even if, even if you don't um, uh, choose to use those benefits, I, I think um, it's important to, like, be included to have the option um, as you're paying into that. Um, so the, um, these other, other pairs like progeny and, and so on, just truly by, by not, um, defining who can access their benefits has like really revolutionized the number of patients that we're seeing. And, and also like how many people are, are frankly interested in, 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 um, starting, starting their family. It's, um, not surprisingly, when you like lower barriers to, to certain things, more people come and more, you know, the interest is, is broader than maybe initially expected. So you know, I think this, I think over the next 10 to 15 years, we're going to see a tremendous um, increase in the number of, of gay, gay patients that we're caring for. And I think really important to like make, ensure that your, your practice is, is up to date and contemporary with you know, uh, um, this type of consult and this type of care. I want to ask you about the, about where you see the trend going, because you're, you're managing third party and LGBTQ plus patients are a part of that. And you said one, in, you said about one out of five patients is LGBTQ plus. That's right. and, and, and so do you see within that, you mentioned, you think it's going to grow in the next 15 years. Uh, are we already starting to see some doctors that is there enough demand now that in a large city that one doctor could say, you know, uh, well, of course I see anybody, but, but, but given their caseload, they're, they're, you know, they only see gay male patients. Are, like, one, are we already starting to see that? Two, is that what you're talking about when you're seeing that growth in the next decade and a half? It's a really interesting question. And I honestly feel like based on my own clinical volume, I could do that. I almost could do that now. My partners would probably kill me. Um, but why, why, <laughs> why, why would your partners kill you? Well, no, just, just based on the clinical volume. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think frankly, um, at, at some point I'll probably be there. Um, there's, you know, um, Mark Lee and at RMA, um, Connecticut is, is really become a mentor of mine over the years. Um, and he's honestly the only, one of the only docs that I know that like exclusively cares for um, men going, going through the, the process. I don't know if I would necessarily like be that specific in like all egg donation, all surrogacy. I, I frankly like the whole breadth of, you know, doing donor inseminations for single women and, and lesbian women, and, and frankly, just, you know, being, uh, helping, helping um, members of this community, um, you know, um, get, get to the point of being a parent. So I do think, you know, in particular, I do know some other 
you know, recent graduates that are gay and are, are open about, about their life experiences, and I think have interest in this as well. Um, and even some current fellows that, that may as well too. So I, I genuinely think that this is like, you know, it's a very specific segment, um, but I think if done well, you can, you can um, this can be like a, a reason people seek out, you know, your, your practice and it's a way to differentiate your practice, frankly. Dr. Leon Darris has been on the show as well. We'll link to that episode. It's probably a two-year-old episode now. But we'll link to it in the show notes. Um, why did you move out to the Bay Area, Dan? I moved to San Francisco to uh, help uh, RMA of Northern California open and kind of establish their third-party program um, and help develop kind of LGBTQ care here as well. Um, I also am like joined two really great friends um, as as partners, and um, it was a, a, another you know great opportunity at the right time. So is is RMA of the Bay is that also part of EVRMA or it's different? Because I know that they're you know, like they like you mentioned Mark Linderis of RMA of Connecticut who who have just rebranded so they're Loom Fertility now. Like that's not part of EVRMA, and neither neither is RMA of New York. And then you know there was RMA of Texas and they're and they're not an RMA anymore. And then there's others that are they're all straight up part of the same EVRMA company. Nobody seems to know the answer to that. So where where do you guys fall in that spectrum? It's a it's a great question, Griffin. Um, we are part of the RMA network or EVRMA in in Northern California. Okay, so you're, you're so you're you're you're, you're true blue EVRMA. So you were staying within the same company. You exactly. you were you were moving from the East Coast to the West Coast. They they were starting they were building that practice out there, and and there was the opportunity to 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 relocate. Um, you mentioned the 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 the. Are there any other major? I mean, New Jersey had a had a mandate. Um, you mentioned though that their their mandate wasn't completely inclusive and. Uh, and then, and now you're in the Bay. Were there other major differences between the two states that are worth mentioning? That's interesting. Um, I would say in California, um, particularly in the Bay Area, there is more directed, like known egg and sperm donation than out east, at least currently, or, or where in, in New Jersey I was in practice, in that you know, um, individuals and couples come with like a particular person in mind that they're wanting to donate. And I think it frankly speaks to like how fluid certain kind of families are and like what a family looks like in, in the 21st century um, in that, you know, I have frankly friends that, you know, other gay men who have acted as you know, a sperm donor for like a single woman, for example. And so in, in California, I see more and more of those kind of creative ways that you can start your family. And I think it's really rewarding to, to not only help like screen and educate the, the sperm or egg donor and what they're doing and, and link them up with, you know, reproductive psychologists and counselors who help them navigate, frankly, what this means for their life and, and, um, you know, what, what type of relationship they want to have with the child. Um, but it's, it's, you know, I think more and more, at least in this community, um, important for, uh, for patients to like know their donor. So I think the trend is probably moving away from kind of anonymous uh, or not known egg donation and, and sperm don donation. People, you know, frankly, you know, we talk at every consult when when using donor gametes that you know it's not truly anonymous. And in particular, with you know Facebook and 23andMe, Google Image search, if you wanted to find your donor, like an anonymous donor, you absolutely would would be able to do so or like often so for the, for that reason we don't say anonymous anymore but are you saying not just uh, you know not 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 just for that reason can we not say anonymous are you also saying that we're moving away from undisclosed that it's, are we moving back toward or are we moving towards disclosed for that reason 
Yeah, I mean, I, I see more and more people choosing like the open ID or identity release where you can like learn about the sperm donor at age 18 if the child wants to, or doing truly like known or directed sperm or egg donation, just so you, the child has an option to, to like meet, meet their, um, you know, their um, part of their origin story. And, you know, couples navigate that differently. Sometimes the couple or the child would never want to explore that. Uh, and others, others are really um, curious about that. When my husband and I went, went through egg donation, we, um, we wanted to, to like have an egg donor that we knew. And um, we did so through, you know, the, through the practice and, and met her not only really for two reasons. One was to, um, so, you know, to protect that option for future contact. Uh, but secondly, it was, was frankly just wanting to thank her for, for truly like what a life-changing thing that she has done through egg donation. And every donor that I meet, um, I tell, tell him or her that in that I, I genuinely thank them for like what they're doing for, for that couple. And I think on a busy day, it's like easy to, to lose that perspective and it's easy to you know think about the egg donor who had 30 eggs retrieved and what a great response she had but in particular like you know going home to a child from an egg donor and like playing ball in the backyard or holding your your son um reading them a book like recognizing that like the only reason that that you're in that space is through like some altruistic act that that someone else went through, I um, I think it gives you like a tremendous amount of um, perspective and just you you feel so grateful that like what what these men and women are doing and so you know I I like caring for the donors themselves too so it's a part of part of that is like you know educating them not only about their own fertility and like about their their um, their hormones and their body, uh, but also just, you know, letting them know what an important task that, what an important endeavor that they're undertaking and, and to thank them. Well, we've made some creative about that. And that makes me think of some more and that topic could be, could be its own show topic. <laughs> I'm going to let you conclude the way you want to conclude about the future of third party, about the future of serving LGBTQ plus patients. But before I let you conclude, however you want, I'm going to, I want to drag you into a fight, Dan, and you can choose to pick a side in the fight. You could choose to break up the fight. Uh, but I am dragging you in here. And this is the fight, which is recently I've, I've had, everybody's allowed on the show. We've, we've had 130 plus. I think you're going to be Episode something, 130 plus. Amazing. Everybody is allowed on the show. Small practices, large practices, people that are coming from venture capital and private equity, people that say they're going to stay independent forever. Everybody's allowed on. Recently, I've, I've had a couple groups on, one in particular that has a model of expanding uh, or you know their value prop, whether they serve it or not is another question, but their value prop is to expand care by uh, having... REIs oversee uh, OBGYNs or maybe PAs and NPs. And, uh, and so this, this has started some stuff. I, I think they're going to come back on the show. Some of, of you know, at least one of the doctors that I uh, had at Chris has, has volunteered to come on and, and, and hash this out. And, uh, and I was at PCRS and people were bringing it up to me. And so I wonder where you sit on this. And I want to say, I did get emails from REIs as well. It said, I, I love this idea. Can I, can I talk to these people? Um, and there are REIs that are already doing this model on, on their own. Um, but the objection of, of course was Dan, that, that can somebody just, can just a, a generalist OBGYN who's never sat through any part of fellowship training, do what I do. And, uh, and you know, where are they being trained? Are they, are they being shipped down someplace? How many cases is the REI overseeing? How closely are they overseeing them? Are they doing it remotely? Are they right there in the office? And so uh, you're a board certified REI indeed, and you're someone that sees the bottleneck of care and that only a fraction of the people that need treatment in this country are getting it. 
where do you opine on a solution like this? Yeah, it, this is, um, I think, an important point, and I, I think we'll 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 see this settle out sometime in the next five to ten years, in my opinion. And I completely agree that you you speak you you talk to different REIs, and you'll get different opinions of this. Um, I my personal take on this is truly I could not um, be the doctor that I am care for the number of patients that I do on a, on a regular basis, care um, for the type of patients that I do without, you know, advanced practitioners like nurse practitioners and, and um, physician assistants. For example, you know, our, our practice in Northern California is relatively small in terms of physicians. I'm one of three docs here. Um, and then we have three advanced practitioners, so two NPs and one um, PA. And you know the the uh, advanced practitioners help with monitoring, with ultrasound, with inseminations, with saline sonograms, with notably donor screening, with gestational carrier screening. Um, and they're su- absolutely superb in what they do, and they bring such a a um, additional um, um, you know kind of level of care to, to patients. And, you know, I think our, our member of the team, like are absolutely critical to, to our team um, functioning as it does. So I think they frankly allow me to be a better doctor. And, um, you know, the, I honestly go to them sometimes asking their opinion of things. If I have a catheter placement for a saline sonogram, that's tricky. And my partner is out that day. Absolutely. I'm going to, ask for, you know, one of the nurse practitioners to come see if she can, she can pass it. So I have no, no pride there whatsoever. And um, we're, you know, we've two of the three advanced practitioners that, that are on staff with us right now, we've trained like from the beginning and, and you can um, absolutely have, have them kind of augment augment your practice and some of could you manage to- 10 of them or 20 of them remotely and could you or if they're OBGYNs and if they're doing the retrievals and the transfers are you still on board then yeah it's a great question whether like to what what point of of care that that someone outside of a an REI doc would would be involved I personally think like embryo transfers should there's so much an embryo transfer is like the culmination of someone's treatment um, and so much goes into that in terms of the IVF lab, the cost, the emotions, the, the physical aspect of IVF. I personally don't think, you know, many patients would, would be on board with um, having a non-physician uh, or like not even their, you know, own doctor not do not do the embryo transfer. So I think that well, might they be- might if it's a question of eight in, <laughs> of eight grand all in, Dan, you know, including meds and everything else versus 20 grand all in they, they might Dan. It, it no, I mean, if particularly if you tie it to cost, I mean, you have a compelling point that like maybe, maybe, maybe they don't care as much as, 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 as they might expect, but there's always going to be, um, you know, patients that do. And, um, you know, I, I think we're at a unique kind of crossroads in the, in the specialty in that, like, we're seeing increasing volume. Um, we have like a certain number of trainees, 40 plus that, you know, are finished fellowship each year. Um, and, and as you, in your own words, there's a, you know, a bottleneck in clinical care. And so, I see a couple of things happening, frankly. I mean, I see some some practices going the route that are, you know, cost cutting and and ways to offer more affordable fertility care and like improve access to care, uh, with in the hope of you know driving up numbers and driving up, um, frankly, the number of patients that you can help. And then I see other practices uh, taking a different stance and like this is like a kind of a premium product that we're offering and, you know, people are willing to pay like a higher dollar for higher value, for better outcomes, for more more personalized attention. So, I mean, I I honestly think there's probably space for both in, in fertility care because not every patient is looking for the same thing. And I think like to um, pigeonhole like all fertility patients into wanting like a lower cost option 
I think it doesn't capture the breadth of patients that we see. I think there's room for kind of both of those models. Um, so, you know. This should, this should be a debate at ASM. It really should. And <laughs> I, it, no, I agree. And, I think- and not in one of the little breakout rooms either. It should be in the big room because I think I, I, I think it would shake up some salt. You could be the moderator. <laughs> and uh, I, think, I think that it's a, a good topic. And it would be standing room only. I, it, uh, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think it's it's a, an important important thing. Um, and I think if we don't actively like discuss it, it's um, you know, I think there is some tension there. About but I don't want so, I don't want somebody like you arguing either side, Dan. You're too in the middle. I want people on hard on each side arguing it, and then I want somebody like you to, to moderate. moderate. Yeah, to, yeah, to moderate it. I'm and, I'm a good Switzerland. <laughs> okay. You can be, you can be Switzerland in that case. Uh, I'm Switzerland on the show, but I have zero clinical knowledge, which is why I always, whenever I bring somebody on like that, I say, this is what I'm seeing in the marketplace. You all decide if it's clinically valid, if it's, if it's the, if it's the best standard of care or even acceptable standard of care, I'm not qualified to give first aid to a paper cut. I was a D student. And then I went and got a communications degree from Oswego state, which is why I own a marketing firm. So I let people talk and then I, I let the, the clinicians decide for itself. But I think that would be a, a great uh, for you to debate. And before I let you conclude, I want to say, if anyone is listening, I would love to do an episode from somebody from a bog to talk about what it would actually, what would actually be involved in going from 40 fellowship programs to a hundred. Uh, I've kind of asked guests that a la carte on the show. I would love to talk to somebody from ABOG who who could really spend a podcast episode going through what that would be like to go from 40 episodes to 100. So if anybody's listening, that's a that's an invitation or a request to email me if you can hook that up. Dr. Kayser, I'm going to let you conclude with how you want to, either about serving LGBTQ plus patients or just about third party program in general uh the audience is yours and what are you paying attention to what what do you want to see for the field how would you like to conclude thanks griffin for having me on the show i'm a a fan and and like it's really an amazing opportunity for me to to talk to you about this um you know i would leave you with you know for for listeners who you know, whether you're a physician or a nurse or an embryologist or in marketing at a, at a practice, really any role is, is just to look inward um, for a moment uh, in terms of how you're caring for, for the gay community. And, you know, I had given a, a talk at the most recent uh, PCRS this year um, about quote unquote LGBTQ friendly practice and how, how do you build an LGBTQ friendly practice? I had just finished at the, when I was putting together the slide deck, I had just finished um, uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist by, by Ibram X. Kendi, a fantastic book that like talks about just structural racism and just, uh, you know, um, how, how things embedded in, in the system, um, whether conscious or not, can impact people's lives in a material way. And in reading that book, I started in, in preparing my slides for that talk, I started to think about, you know, is, is really, are we really talking about LGBTQ friendly care? You know, is that really what our patients deserve? And I, I came to the conclusion ultimately that we should really be doing better than LGBTQ friendly. What, you know, what my community is looking for in fertility care is to go to like a welcoming practice, a practice that celebrates their, their family story and frankly, one that's not homophobic. Um, and so like the thesis of that presentation was not talking about how to uh, like run an LGBTQ friendly practice, but rather how to run an anti-homophobic practice. And, you know, I think semantics are important. Um, and I think if you haven't read that book, it's absolutely worth the read, How to Be an Anti-Racist. And I think it gave me some of the tools to think like critically about my own practice and ways to improve it and would just encourage listeners to, to do the same. And, and um, 
you know, consider um, how how we can rise rise to the unique challenge of of um, caring caring for for men and women who want nothing more um, when they're sitting across from you to to become a parent. Well, uh, Dr. Dan Kayser, thank you for coming on the show. I have a another book, which is also which is a rebuttal by John McWhorter, but check out both books and Dan had the, had the last word. So read Dr. Kayser's book recommendation first. Uh, Dr. Dan Kayser, thank you so much for coming on inside reproductive health. Thanks. Griffin.